This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetacy. I'm Bridget Fetacy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week on Walk-Ins Welcome, I'm very excited to have Sam Harris. Sam Harris is a neuroscientist, philosopher, and author of five New York Times bestsellers. His work covers a wide range of topics, neuroscience, moral philosophy, religion, meditation practice, human violence, rationality, but generally focuses on how a growing understanding of ourselves and the world is changing our sense of how we should live. I'm with Sam Harris, everybody. Welcome to Watkins Welcome. Happy to be here, Bridget. It it took a while. I know. I'm so I'm so excited. I, I, I'm a little bit nervous, to be totally honest, because you are just somebody that I have looked up to for so long. It's just a strange phenomenon to be able to actually talk to you. All right. Well, let me show you my feet of clay. <laughs> I, I, my biggest question that I have right out of the gates is, what's your morning routine? Uh, you know, well, here, here's uh, more reason not to uh, admire me. I, I, I have no morning routine really, <laughs> apart from stumbling out of bed and getting to uh, the uh, the tea kettle or a, a cup of coffee. You know, by, I, I kind of alternate there, but. Um, yeah, I, I'm not a morning person. I've never been a morning mm. person. I um, I occasionally troll Jocko Willink, who gets up every <laughs> every day at 4:30 and and has a cult of people following him, you know, taking photos of their watches. And, oh, uh, I know. And you know, I, I'm I'm more likely to stay up until four in the morning than than get up at four in the morning. So uh, I, I'm I've always been pretty nocturnal, and and so the mornings for me are just. Uh, Try, me trying to reboot the hard drive uh, and, you know, eventually get into a productive frame of mind. But I, I don't have any discipline around that first hour or two. I just, it's basically just bailing water uh, neurologically. <laughs> Do you meditate every day? Uh, I, well, it's a somewhat complicated answer to that. As you know, I have a, a meditation app and, and meditation is something that I'm I'm spending a lot of time on. I I tend to sit formally most days, uh, but not every day. And for me, for for, uh, quite some time, practice has been a matter of me really paying attention to many, many short moments throughout the Mm -hmm. day. I mean, the goal for me is, I think the goal for anyone ultimately is to erase the boundary between formal practice and the rest of life. And so, you know, I've always emphasized or, you know, for a long time I've emphasized finding the moments that are every bit as clear and free of the illusion of self in one's normal waking life that are, you know, identical to the kinds of experiences one has either in a formal session or even in the the best part of a, a long meditation retreat and mm. and many of the and the sense that that's not possible or that's hard to do is is something to to get over and so so yeah I, I, it's more for me about punctuating a normal day with you know 500 or a thousand moments than it is getting a, a solid hour of practice in the morning or, or any other period of time. Um, mm-hmm. And so, and it just to, the goal really is to make uh, the same kind of demands one makes on oneself in a retreat, where you're trying to be continuously mindful. So you have these these formal sessions of sitting and walking, um, and you, you, you know, though you, you you do that on retreat for you know twelve hours a day or fourteen hours a day, but then you have all the other moments in the day when you're going to get a cup of tea or whatever, and those are considered just as central to the practice. You're trying to pay right. attention, uh, you know, as clearly in those moments as well. And so, I've now, you know, adopting that in my life as much as as possible. And it's not to say that formal practice isn't still helpful. It is, but it's not. Um, it, you know, it's not my focus as much as as you might think. But yeah, on most days, I 
I tend to sit for, you know, I mean, Sophie, you, know, you, you and I are talking now at 1230. Uh, I sat for like 10 minutes a couple of hours ago. I'll probably sit again at some point, but uh, mm-hmm. it's much more for me about finding all these other interstitial moments where where I can just recognize uh, what I'm, what's there when you're no longer lost in thought. Mm-hmm. We, I've spent some time on ashrams and done a lot of different meditations. There was one person in Japan who made all of the people practicing with him go to the subway during rush hour and mm-hmm. sit so that they could be distracted basically. And even recently I was in a meditation and somebody's phone went off and people were getting annoyed and the guy who was leading it made everybody turn their phones on. And he was saying essentially what you, you just said, what's the use of this? If you have to be sitting in a silent room, there's no point in this practice. If you get annoyed by a ding and that is irritating to you. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what practice you're doing, because there are some practices where, you know, if if concentration on a single object is the goal, well, then, you know, thoughts and anything else uh, is, uh, you know, even external sounds are by definition a distraction. But, you know, for, for a practice like mindfulness, anything that you can possibly notice is a fit object of, you know, recognizing consciousness and its contents and so the, you know sounds i mean you, you can literally be right next to a construction site and it's it's it should be no different you might have a preference if if the the noises are really unpleasant but it's it's still it's anything can be incorporated in the practice so that's, mm-hmm. that's definitely the kind of practice i recommend i've been taking your meditation app and quarantine uh-huh. uh pretty pretty religiously actually not to no pun intended <laughs> um nice. i and it's definitely more clinical than what i'm used to which i appreciate it has the scientific approach because i think there's so much woo surrounding the the world of meditation mm. and it can turn people off and what i appreciate about yours is the is the heady diagnosis of consciousness although it does make me feel sometimes like i'm on drugs Mm. which as someone sober i also appreciate um (laughs) you're getting 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 them for free without without violating any principles it's a trip the whole idea of the headlessness i i have a i have a very that one kind of messes my brain up Mm. what what was what practice did you do before i mean i've just been really just standard mindfulness I think is I I've had lots of different experiences I was at a a retreat in New Zealand and it was an old lineage and they did the golden silence from you know 8 p.m to 8 a.m and the um I I've just had just sitting mostly and paying attention to breath Mm -hmm. and nothing as formal as your training by any means. And I still, when I first got sober, we have, there are meetings in Los Angeles and there are 20 minutes of sitting meditation. They used, they used to be at this meditation place until the guy got me too. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then the place. Unfortunately, got... <laughs> that's a, that's an all too common story. It's really quite amazing. It's crazy, yeah. but I'm not surprised. Yeah. And so they generously let us use the place. And every morning at 730, I, it's 20 minutes of meditation. And then you would share about whatever your experience was because meditation is recommended in, in the 12 steps. And that saved me in early sobriety. I did it every single day. Mm-hmm. Just being able to put that distance between my racing at the time thoughts and not having to identify with every single thought and having that morning practice was just, it was funny. They were building the rail right next to this place and there was a jackhammer for Mm -hmm. probably the first three months of my sobriety. And it was you, it was indistinguishable from what my brain actually sounded like. It was a perfect, so that, and then this has been nice because I feel like it's, it's a, I like the scientific aspect of it that you bring have you been finding that people are gravitating to it more in this crazy time that we're in? Uh, yeah, it's been, 
I think it is it is more well, one thing that I've noticed is that you know we we offer the app for free to anyone who can't afford it and that, that's just I make that explicit you know in every context that I can and as you might expect the the request for free subscriptions has gone up now and so um I think that the net result is there are definitely more people on it I think probably the number of actual subscribers is is kind of is pretty constant but um but yeah, no, it's, you know, there's a lot of people using it. It's really gratifying to have something to put out there that is that is um, helping people and 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 seems appropriate to this period of time, right? It's, it's um, yeah, I'm just very happy to it's finally out there. As as you might know, it took me forever to finally get it out, and it it, it mm-hmm. took like two years to get the beta version out, and 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 now now it's been out for about a year and a half. And uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I'm, I'm very very happy. It's it's uh, seen the light of day. I have to say, I love it and all of the extra, the extra, you know, lessons that you give on the side, as well as just the guided meditations. Mm. Those are fantastic. And now I saw that you have David White on there, who's one of my favorite poets. Yeah, he's awesome. Or, he's amazing. He, he has such an amazing voice too. I, mean, I love his poetry, mm-hmm. but to hear him read it and and to reflect on it it's just his voice is is priceless when you started on this journey of meditation what what got you there uh well drugs initially you know mm-hmm. the, the first yep. uh my first two well actually the, the first experience was an mdma trip so not, not technically a, a psychedelic but um after MDMA, and it really, really was the f- just one trip. You know, I, I think I did MDMA ten or twelve times in the end. I, ha- I haven't done it for many, many years, like mm-hmm. you know, close to thirty years, I think. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, MDMA was was really a a revelation to me. I mean, it just it, I don't know. It's even hard to recapture who I was prior to that experience. But I was clearly someone who hadn't had any experience like that right there was just no right. sense that the mind could become that pliable and and happy a place to be right it's just and the, the overwhelming experience was of love and gratitude uh, but it just was such a a a downpouring of positive emotion mm-hmm. and 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 uh, really ethical wisdom. I mean, just just to suddenly see past all of the the pseudo problems in my life and to realize my my connection to you know, everyone, not just not just friends and family, but everyone potentially, and and just the fact that I wished everyone well. That was my default state. Right? I actually want everyone to be happy. And that, that, and to plunge into the implications of that, I mean, it's, it's simple to say that, and it doesn't seem like it goes very far. But when you actually, you know, find that dial in your mind and turn it up to eleven, you know, the the feeling of of unconditional love for all conscious beings. I mean, it just it it's it was just an extraordinary experience that I, I did not think. You know, I'm sure I, I'm sure I hadn't thought about it at all but you know had you asked me to think about it i would have just ruled it out as as psychologically impossible or or if possible you know a sign of mental illness or you know it's just otherwise <laughs> undesirable and but but to experience that for a few hours and then to come to come down and realize well that oh, that is a capacity of the human mind that is is inherent to it, you know, you know whether you know whether you're going to think purely in neurological terms or, or in some other framing, you know, you know the drug is not causing your brain to do something your brain can't do. Right. And so then thereafter, I, I became interested in other methods by which to to access that kind of experience and and different experiences. But because you know, it's for me now, unconditional love while. Desirable and and wonderful isn't actually the center of the bullseye, in terms of you know the the goal of of contemplative practice. Um, so um, yeah, so I, I just moved on to. I, it's not that psychedelics 
stopped, but they, they did, they only continued for a few more years. And then I had like a 25 year hiatus and I just did a mushroom trip about six months ago or so for, for the first time and oh, more, wow. more than 25 years. Wow. Uh, but, um, which was also very interesting and, and, and wonderful and useful, but not, again, not, you know, at this point, not essential. I, I, for me, for many people, but I would say for me, certainly in the beginning, psychedelics were essential just because I was, I was an unpromising candidate for meditation. I mean, I just, I was one, I was just not interested in it. And had I attempted it, I, I think I would have, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have had enough concentration to have noticed anything of, of uh, any significance early enough to keep me doing it. Mm -hmm. And so to have my, the habit patterns of my mind just, you know, fundamentally overridden for a few hours mm by MDMA and, and then later uh, LSD, uh, that was just, it, it proved to me that, you know, that whatever I thought I was doing with my life, it was possible to have a much richer experience of consciousness in the present moment than I was tending to have. And, right. and that was, you know, that was just not something I, I was going to discover even if I understood it in the abstract, I, I, without the experience, I, I just would never have committed to to finding it by another method. And what were you doing in your life at the time? How old were you? Uh, I was 18. It was my sophomore year in college. Yeah, I, for the, the, MD, the first MDMA trip, yeah, was, I was, uh, I think it was like spring break of my sophomore year and um you know i came back to campus a, a wild-eyed maniac uh, <laughs> trying to convince all my friends of uh you know basically sharing the gospel with with uh, my closest friends uh and then yeah then i got uh, i got interested in in meditation and and eastern philosophy started reading books and, and that summer i sat a first retreat and then had my first acid trip on that retreat i you know this was a retreat where you could this was a retreat with ramdas and and you know, it mm -hmm. turned out my roommate uh, happened to have some acid so <laughs> so I, I i managed to to uh kill two birds with one stone then you know the next year or so was a period where i was i got especially focused on mindfulness practice and started sitting mindfulness retreats of, you know, n not very long, but I, I guess I, you know, a weekend and, and, right. uh, here and there. And then eventually I started sitting 10 day retreats. And, um, at this point I, I dropped out of school. Um, so I had, I had time and then I, I, I made my way to India and, um, then for the, the decade of my 20s, it was just a lot of retreat and a lot of uh, instruction in India and Nepal. I think I made seven or so trips to, to India and as many wow. to Nepal and then spent about two years on silent meditation retreats, uh, the, the longest of which were three months long, but I, I sat a bunch of two months and one month. And, um, and I was writing during that period as well, but I, I, you know, it was much more. Initially, I was writing fiction. I thought I, I wanted to write novels, so I was writing novels. And and each time I would finish one, I would realize uh, it was not really good enough for me to stand behind, and mm -hmm. and I, I really hadn't tried to get anything published. Uh, but then I transitioned to nonfiction at some point toward the end of my twenties. I was writing about really, really in the philosophy of mind, writing about uh, consciousness and trying to integrate the, the experiences I had been having in meditation and my my reading in, in philosophy now now both Western and Eastern philosophy. Mm -hmm. and then and then I and, and then I realized suddenly I had to go back to school because wow. there's just no way to write nonfiction having dropped out of college and and uh, done little more on paper than, recapitulate the 60s for oneself <laughs> uh, so then i so then i went back to school and and then w went and went to graduate school and and that's that's what happened wow i actually had no idea that you had dropped out and taken that kind of long sabbatical into the 
state of consciousness. So you're pretty well equipped for this quarantine life, I would imagine, with all of the time. What would you tell people about how meditation can help one with psychological resilience? Well, it's about, I guess I would take it from the other side. I mean, meditation is often described as a practice, you know, which is to say it's something you're doing, it's something you're adding to your mm -hmm. experience. But once you know how to do it, and again, I'm, now I'm talking about mindfulness, not some other concentration practice. Once you really understand what's happening, y you discover that it, it, it actually isn't something you're doing. It's not a practice. It's not actually uh, something you're adding or, or, or superimposing upon experience, uh, you're actually doing less of something rather than right. more of something. And uh, what you're doing less of is uh, spending your every waking moment lost in thought, which is to say mm -hmm. identified with each thought that arises in consciousness. Uh, and so the, I mean, the default state is to be thinking without knowing that you're thinking. And then you're, you're just the mere hostage of whatever the contents of those thoughts are. So if those are, mm -hmm. you know, self-hating thoughts or you know, anxiety producing thoughts or you know thoughts wherein you're you're judging yourself or judging others or yeah, I mean it's just it's a conversation you're having with yourself somewhat paradoxically because there's, there's not two of you but you you it has this structure that like you're the one talking and you're the one listening and you know, as though that really had to happen, right? Um, right. <laughs> and which is weird, you know, it's like, you know, you know what's happening, but you're at the same time, you're telling yourself what's happening as though there's part of you that isn't, you know, in on the joke or can't see through your eyes, you know, so you're narrating your experience. And you're, you're, th again, you're thinking without knowing that you're thinking and just, and the, the mm -hmm. signature of that is that it feels like you, it feels like a self, right? So, you know, someone listening to us now might be thinking, oh, what the fuck is this guy talking about, right? So like right. That, that, that's a thought, right? And that feels, <laughs> I mean, one, it, 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 cut, it, it ushers in a, an emotional tone to uh, the mind. I mean, it, it becomes a lens an emotional lens through which you're perceiving the present moment. So if, 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 if that was the thought, you know, it very likely comes with a feeling of doubt or, uh, you know, skepticism or, or just um, judgment. Uh, judgment about what you're hearing or just, a, you know, a, a kind of a, a resistance to a claim that's being made. And um, it's not to say, I'm, you know, I'm certainly not advocating that people, uh, not be skeptical or not not doubt things that are that are eminently doubtable. I mean, obviously, I'm not arguing that we don't need our our critical uh, faculties or, or that thought isn't useful. But there is a difference between recognizing thought as a process and recognizing the the context in which it's appearing, recognizing right. that it's an automaticity, recognizing that you're not you're not authoring your thoughts. In fact, there, there is no you who's authoring. Who's thinking the thoughts? There's no thinker in addition to the thoughts. There's no thinker who's who pulling is pulling them off the shelf or pushing them out into, into consciousness. There's simply the next thought arising, and in most cases, it goes unrecognized and it just it comes up from behind you in a way and just see and just seems to be what you are as a matter of subjectivity. So again, you think well. You know, well, that's not right, or what? Okay, but wait a minute. He was just saying, and, and so the, all of that, th that voice in the head, can be recognized in the same way that you can you can hear my voice now, and it doesn't feel like you. You can hear your own voice as a, mm -hmm. as an object in consciousness, and recognize that you as a, as the as the subject are really just the context in which it's appearing, and that. You know the the connection to to resilience is is pretty direct because you know, you then recognize that more or less all of your psychological suffering is meted out to you in those moments when you're identified with thoughts that are making right. you suffer. I mean, you're just thinking about mm -hmm. how you know you know uncertain the future is and how worried you are that you know people close to you are are going to get sick and die or that you're going to lose your job or 
you've lost your job and you're thinking about that, the implications of that. And again, I'm not saying that there's nothing that ever needs to be thought through. I mean, obvi- mm-hmm. Obviously, there's a lot that, that you know, that, uh, our ability to think and plan is the, the only thing that differentiates us really from, you know, other primates, right? So basically right. everything that's good about being a person is to some degree mediated by thought, but the, the, it's an enormous blessing to be able to get off the ride whenever you see that it's it's going nowhere worth going, right? So right. I, I use, you know, the experience of anxiety now or anger or any other you know classically negative emotion for me it's it's a it's a signal that there's something that needs to be paid attention to right it's like mm-hmm. this is here's a is there is there a problem to solve here is is the question worth answering and if there is well then just solve the problem and if there isn't right. well then let go of it in both cases you don't need to feel this feeling for very long in order to be responsive to the, the needs of the moment that was really what I learned about anxiety was that it was a signpost that something I was ignoring something that mm-hmm. I needed to either deal with or that w- I was repressing. And it's interesting because I find in this political climate that exact paradox between acceptance and change is challenging because at what point do I let go of that which I can't control and accept that this is just something that infuriates me? And how often do I let these things infuriate me? How do you apply your practice of mindfulness to the current political state of the world? Well, for me, it's it, it applies everywhere in the same way. So it's not just my response to politics, although that's... Uh, <laughs> a, a landscape of frustration, but um, it, you know, it, whenever I experience you know anger or anxiety or fear or uh, you know self judgment or regret, I mean, it just moods that you almost by definition don't want to spend a lot of time in. Mm-hmm. Um, again, there there are signals that that something may need to be attended to or or changed or you know there's some. Some, something to respond to, something to recognize about a relationship, say. But then the moment I become mindful of the thoughts and the the emotions that they're linked to, uh, the process and the half-life of the the negative mental state is incredibly brief. I mean, it's just there's no way to stay angry or mm-hmm. anxious unless you get lost in thought again about the reasons why you should be angry or anxious. Right. And so, you know, in dealing with, you know, in, in responding to current events, it's the same thing. I'll, I'll see some fresh atrocity coming out of Trump's mouth. And, you know, I'll, I'll recognize how I feel about that and and feel that in many cases, you know, outrage is, is warranted. I mean, it's, it's, it's energy that you can and should use to do something, you know, whether it's writing an op-ed or, you know, saying something on a podcast or, you know, booking a, booking a guest who can, who can speak for an hour about this particular topic that suddenly became interesting or, or important. But the moment you've, you've taken that step, the feeling of outrage is not something that, that's useful in a, in a, and it's not even possible to maintain again, unless you sort of go to sleep and and lose yourself in thoughts for you know minutes at a time and and so g- given that I'm constantly trying to break that spell uh, it you know it, it, none of these states last long right. um, so so again for for me progress in meditation hasn't been a matter thus far of closing the door to any specific emotion I mean there's no emotion that I felt before I learn to meditate that I'm incapable of feeling now. So I, I can get angry, I can get anxious, uh, et cetera. But it's just, the difference is in how long these things last. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's orders of magnitude shorter in terms of just how quickly these these states of mind degrade and and become, I mean, the, the, the crucial insight is that no one is really making you angry or anxious right. or afraid. I mean, it's like, like yes, you can point to the thing in the world that you think is the justification 
for your current mental state, but in each moment, the, the, the mechanism that is allowing for you to stay angry or stay afraid is this, this moment by moment failure to recognize thoughts as thoughts. Right. And so, do you go to therapy? No, no, I, I did um, as, a, as a teenager uh, for, for a while. I'm not sure that was especially useful, but, it, but I did it then. And then I, then uh, my wife and I had a, had a period where we, um, around the time we had our, our first daughter, where we went to, to couples therapy, and that was hugely useful. That was just mm-hmm. an, an amazingly uh, great for us to do. So I, I recommend it, but I have, it's been a very long time since, you know, since I was one-on-one with a therapist. What are some of the most uncomfortable moments and challenges you've experienced in your practice of meditation throughout, I guess now, 30-plus years? Was there ever mm. a period where you just were like, fuck it, I'm not, what is this, and this is crazy? <laughs> yeah, well, so, actually, so some of the, the hardest periods were the were at the point where I was most committed to it, but hadn't understood the, um, the difference between practicing in, in a goal-oriented way, and you know, which is to say a, a, a dualistic way, and what I later came to discover as as a, a more non dual, uh, goal free style of practice, um, and this is something I, I write about in my book Waking Up at some point. Mm-hmm. In, in when I talk about you know gradual versus sudden views yeah. of awakening, and I, I talk about it on the app and in one of the lessons. I actually just read from the book in one of those lessons. Yeah, so so there was a period where I was practicing. Vipassana, which is mindfulness practice, in a very traditional, striving sort of way, where there's you know when it's when it's presented in the the most traditional context, it it tends to be explicitly goal oriented, where you you go onto a you know, a meditation retreat, let's say for for two months, and you're you're in silence for for those two months. There's absolutely nothing to do other than meditate. And the goal is to link uh, as many moments of mindfulness together as you can so as to have a kind of breakthrough experience, which is, you know, is called, uh, you know, the experience of nibbana in Pali or nirvana in, in, in Sanskrit. And, you know, there, there are schools of Buddhism that talk about the, the nirvana being coincident with ordinary waking consciousness. But mm. this, this traditional school of in which many people are getting their vipassana practice you know explicitly influenced by a, a, a few prominent burmese meditation masters mm-hmm. um, disavows that framing and really describes nirvana as a specific experience you can have that uproots various you know in buddhism what are called defilements of mind and 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 so you're you're really on some level are trying to get elsewhere in your practice. It's not. I mean, you're 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 paying moment to moment attention to seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking. You're you're balancing your mind. You're get you're getting as equanimous as possible. You're not grasping at at pleasant experience, and you're not pushing unpleasant away. But there is a a kind of hope and fear and striving built into the very logic of what you're doing with your attention because you know you've been told that in in your current state all you'll be able to notice is the on some level the evidence of your unenlightenment and you <laughs> and you need to get up I mean you you really are at the bottom of the mountain and you need to schlep up to the top and you you have to link as many moments of mindfulness as you can together to to get there and you know all of this is compounded by the problem that in that style of teaching mindfulness it's not really pointed out that you can recognize that consciousness is already free of the feeling of self right it's like right. like there, there is no self to transcend right you're right. you're it's not like that the self is really there and you have to figure out how to remove it or 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 blow it up through you know the force of your practice. Um, it's actually not there, and you're you're 
sense that it is there is based on a a you know it can even be a very subtle kind of fixation on even a meditative fixation on the contents of consciousness and in that style of practice you're you're sort of you're sort of taught to fixate on the objects of consciousness in a in a dualistic way mm. and and so for the longest time I was having these great experiences in practice. I mean, I was incredibly happy, and and you know, these are these are very drug like experiences. You you know you know you can have experiences that are exactly like an MDMA trip mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of a long retreat. Certainly, I mean, once you get significant concentration, it is very drug like. It's very blissful, mm -hmm. and you just yes. you feel just intense rapture. And you know, I've never done. Uh, heroin, but I can, you know, I can imagine it's it's a very similar kind of you know blissful experience. <laughs> uh, and you be you can be kind of you can be you you can become a kind of meditative junkie, right? Where you're on some level you really are just getting high on concentration, mm -hmm. and 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 you're you're mistaking those changes in the contents of consciousness for some kind of progress on the path right but of course mm -hmm. it, it can't be a matter of of you know fetishizing those changes mm -hmm. yeah because th they're impermanent i mean by by right. definition anything that wasn't there a moment before is something that will by virtue of having uh, uh, arose in this in this moment it's going to disappear in the next mm -hmm. uh, so the thing you're looking for is something that's inherent to the nature of consciousness that is actually a a durable basis for well-being and and is compatible with any state of waking consciousness. I mean if there's a way to actually be a buddha it has to be compatible with having a conversation with another human being or driving a car or I mean so you can't be so zonked out on on bliss <laughs> that you can't open your eyes, right? Right. <laughs> so so that's that's um it took me a while to cut through my my goal orientation. It really wasn't until I, I met um, there there were there were really two teachers who were who were ne you know instrumental in my kind of breaking free of that that system I was practicing under. But but the w the way I had been practicing, I had probably done about a year on retreat at that point, and had made many trips to India and. I was just there was so much striving and I mean it was it was just the, the burden of having a goal you know I just I, I really wanted to get somewhere I really wanted to become enlightened uh, I had I believed I had seen through all of the um, the superficiality of, of having any other goal at that point I mean right. I, was, I was very young I was in my you know 20s in my early 20s and mid 20s. And I had I had kind of disavowed any other ambition, right? And that and that came with its own psychological pressure, right? I mean, here I was somebody who was supposed to succeed in some way. I mean, I had a very high estimation of myself as a you know as a uh, eighteen year old probably, mm -hmm. and I you know and I I had I had the the estimations of others you know put on me. I mean, people the people thought I was going somewhere, you know, I was a good student and, and all of that. And so I, and then I, when I dropped out of college, I had my reasons for doing that. But I, once I became completely devoted to, to meditation practice, all of the, the dissatisfaction of not having become somebody in the world, uh, got, you know, put on the, on the balance with my, with my spiritual frustrations, right. That I hadn't wow. yet broken through with um you know in in a, in a meditative sense and so i was uh, yeah i was i was pretty uncomfortable until i found a a new way of um practicing so was your plan to just become a buddha or something at that point in your life yeah i mean at that point i i had a you know in again in my early to mid 20s i had a very keen sense of world weariness you know even mm. though it's, i mean just the the pointlessness of seeking any kind of ordinary you know uh, source of, of ego gratification right becoming a, a great writer say like that right. would, initially that that would have been 
uh, the, the thing I would have been shooting for. And and I was, you know, I, I was a, a big reader. I love books. I, you know, I was, I, I could have easily been fantasizing about, you know, publishing my first book um, and the, the significance of all of that. And, and, uh, but once, once I was having a direct experience of, of just the difference between happiness and suffering at the level of, you know, uh, you know identification with thought or not, um, I, I recognized that, well, there's nothing you're going to go out and get in life that will become the real reason why your life is deeply fulfilling. I mean, the, the, your life will be deeply fulfilling by virtue of uh, how much time you're able to spend truly immersed in the present moment in a way that's deeply fulfilling, right? It's like on some mm -hmm. level, you, 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 you can't become happy. You can only be happy. And, and, and the, the difference between being and becoming was something that I was, I was becoming more and more a student of. And yet there was, there was this subtle becoming, you know, getting into the system, even at the level of my meditation practice, you know, becoming, you know, becoming enlightened and, and, you know, getting up to the top of the mountain as opposed to recognizing uh, that, you know, the, you're already there. And, right. and so it was, um, but yeah, I mean, and this was, I mean, it's interesting. You encounter, I mean, I, I, I've met many people in a similarly unhappy spot. You know, there are many people who I, I consider kind of casualties of the Dharma or casualties of, of, you know, one or another spiritual path because there are people who, discover, you know, quite validly that, you know, there's nothing more interesting or profound than living a, a truly examined life and and recognizing the, you know, the, the nature of their own minds and, and and finding people who are devoted to that task to to, you know, to uh, take as good company along the way. And so th these people tend to gravitate toward scenes around teachers and ashrams and spiritual communities. And yet, what you find when you go to these places, you know, even to study with a, with a great teacher who hasn't started sc screwing his, uh, you know, more attractive students, uh, <laughs> you you find people who never quite they, they almost by definition they didn't make it work in the world because right, they're spending right. all their time at an ashram or all their time right. on retreat, and they're they're trying to convince themselves that they're okay with that but it's it's also selecting for a lot of people who for what for one reason run one reason or, or another just couldn't couldn't make it couldn't figure out how to have a satisfying engagement with the world right right and, i mean i say this all the time is i've been to so many ashrams and it is a lot of lost souls mm. a lot it's it's there is something somewhat tragic about it in yeah. a certain respect. Just people who kind of went, and there were moments in my life. Uh, it, there was one I was at in Australia for three weeks, and the guy wanted me to stay pretty much indefinitely. And I could see how easy it would be to get lost down that rabbit hole. But how do you? It's very difficult to find your way back. Yeah, and and you also have a it comes with a belief system and, and a worldview that justifies that you know self sacrifice and 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 self abnegation. I mean, you're you, you know it's it it is true to say that well the only reason why you're uncomfortable spending all your time sweeping up at the ashram <laughs> and not you know finishing your degree at Harvard or whatever it was uh, is because of your ego. Right, like right. It's, it's your ego that cares that you're a college dropout, or that you're, you know, you could have mm -hmm. had a great job at at Google, but now you're, um, in that you're just you're kind of making, you're learning how to be a, a medieval uh, Tibetan Lama, and you know, right. and you know, <laughs> translating texts from Tibetan, um, <laughs> and it, so that subordination of self to this other project. It has a has a, has a framing that seems like, you know, any discomfort you would have in that context is a sign of the very problem you're there to overcome, right? I mean, you're it's, you're you're too self possessed. You know, what do you care what other people think of you? What do you care that your, you know, your mother who had high hopes for you now has, you know, very little she can say that she's comfortable with about you know what you're doing in the world. 
Um, that, those are just thoughts, right? Just get, get over it, right. and that, and that and that's true. And yet, there's there's a there's a lot of dysfunction around you know people's inability to um, you know find the sweet spot with all of this. And and I mean, it's taken me a long time for to to feel like I I've done that for myself. I mean, it really is it, it's taken a very long time, and. Um, uh, you know, I feel very lucky to to have done that. I, I've seen a lot of disillusionment and I've also seen a lot of manipulation around what you're talking about in terms of, oh, don't worry about your parents and all of these. It's how a lot of people end up in bad situations in these ashrams or sometimes cults. But how did you find your way out? At what point did you decide that the kind of earthly pursuits are worthwhile? Well, I guess one crucial thing is that I, I never joined a community or an ashram in in any explicit sense. I mean, I spent a lot of time around a, a few different teachers who you know, you know struck me as as great exemplars of the teachings, but they never struck me as as you know, anything other than human on mm-hmm. on another level, right? So I, I never. I, I mean, I, you know, I guess if you had, if you could have sampled my, my, uh, my brain's activity at various points along the way, you 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 could have found me uh, in a kind of quasi uh, religious frame of mind with respect to some of these people some of the time. But in general, I was always skeptical of adopting the the trappings of a of a a theocracy just because just right. because it came from another culture right so you right. know I, so i never you know I, I guess at one point i might have considered myself a buddhist but i i never really spent any time thinking that the buddhists had a an exclusive uh corner on the market of of truth right i mean the the, the, the truths that i was encountering you know mostly in a buddhist context you know also existed you know elsewhere in the indian tradition and and we're just a Deeper than that, we're, we're, we're a, a capacity of the human mind to be discovered by anyone at any point, and and just you know some cultures had more or less you know accurate accurate or useful concepts around you know how one does that, and and I you know I noticed that you know Western culture and it's in particular Abrahamic religion had you know so much more that was confusing around. Uh, you know, what was necessary to live a, a spiritual life that it was it was less interesting to me. I mean, you know, being told that Jesus is the Son of God is not a great algorithm to to start with when you're trying to figure out, you know, what the what the potential of human consciousness is to mm-hmm. recognize itself prior to the illusion of self. Like it's like there isn't there's just no reason to think about things like virgin births and all the rest, and it, you know, and they're also almost certainly you know fictional in the first place. Um, but so I never, I never got caught as a as a member of a of a cult of any sort, right? And right. so I would just I would meet these teachers. I, you know, the the real value, you know, even more than the relationship to a to a charismatic person who had you know spent many many decades, you know, becoming a kind of meditative athlete. Uh, the real value was in the actual teachings that I could apply or not myself. And if mm-hmm. I could apply them myself, well, then on some level, it, w- it was a matter of of just getting the information and then having the experience, to, you know, you know, using the recipe to to bake the cake for oneself. And so I, w- I was never, I was never infantilized to the degree that you see in many spiritual communities where it's just all about right. the guru and it's you know it, it you know we're so lucky just to be sitting at his feet um uh, i mean again it's not to say that i i don't have deep reverence for some of these teachers who helped me i mean i, I, mean, I met some really extraordinarily beautiful teachers both both buddhist and not but again all of them showed their human side to some degree, right? So it's not a matter of anyone actually being perfect. And so I, I, right. I, came, I came away from all of those those encounters never being tempted to to fully detach from you know my culture or my life in this in this world and just transplant myself in 
in uh, in India or Nepal or or right. in some ashram, <laughs> uh, and you meet people. I mean, you know, I know many people who've spent you know thirty years in in yep. Nepal, right? So there, there's mm-hmm. it's. I saw that that advertised to me, uh, and then I I just also had many other interests which never fully evaporated, right? So mm-hmm. like I when it came time for me to pay attention to something other than than mindfulness, you know, I, I just was captivated by books and by increasingly by conversations about the nature of the mind and, and also just how to think about the project of of living an examined life in the context of a 20th century and then 21st century view of, of human rationality and, and a growing scientific understanding of our ourselves and the world, and and so once once my scientific interests came online, I don't know. It was just there was never a temptation to just check could, out, check out completely. Yeah. Um, I mean, I you know I spent a good long while fairly checked out. I mean, I gave uh, I, I again my the decade of my twenties was almost totally devoted to these esoteric concerns and so when i when i finally had to go back to school at age 30 i think i was 31 when i went back to finish my undergraduate and then went into graduate school you know i felt very late because i i was late right i mean i just you know i had right. it basically was you know having a rip van winkle experience of having lost <laughs> a decade <laughs> and you know, all my friends were you know at that point had careers, and some of them had families, and and so there was a kind of urgency to getting the the machine of a normal life up and running, mm. and and it took me a long time, frankly, to get comfortable with with how I was integrating, you know, all of this stuff. I mean, it just it it took a long while for my. My meditative interests and and you know what what I would have seen as you know the, the true wisdom I have access to uh, took it took a while to integrate that with a a normal career uh, and you know it, it, now it's now I feel like I've arrived in a in a very um, happy place just as the world has gone down into lockdown <laughs> under a global <laughs> pandemic. So, you know, p- pandemics, it turns out uh, a pandemic is my happy place. <laughs> this makes yeah. sense, weirdly. You said earlier in the conversation that from the, when you first took the MDMA, the bullseye was kind of unconditional love, but that's not what you've come to find is the bullseye. What What is it? It's more around this, what's there when the the illusion of the self is cut through. So if mm-hmm. if you if you cut through this sense of subject object perception, the sense that there's a a subject in your head thinking your thoughts, uh, having your experience, that there's that there's a, a center to experience, when that drops out and there's just experience, there's just this this kind of unified sphere of of uh, Seeing and feeling, you know, just the, just the 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 energy of of your sensory experience, but then anything else you can notice about your mind. So I mean, it's like the the, the world you see with your open eyes. I mean, that the, the experience of seeing. I'm not making a a metaphysical claim that the universe is nothing but consciousness, <laughs> but but as a matter of experience, it's nothing but consciousness, right? It's just just right. consciousness and its contents. And there's when when the center of that drops out, which is the feeling that we call I. Uh, what's left is it's um, I mean it's hard to characterize in positive terms, and that's why the Buddhists re- result to words like emptiness or selflessness. But it is it's not a negation of experience. I mean, experience is even more vivid in some way, but it has a kind of dreamlike quality, and it's but it's not one thing. It's not one particular state it, it admits of many different states and, and unconditional love is certainly one of them but the the really vivid experience of unconditional love of the sort that you know I had on my first MDMA trip and which you can have when when you do a practice like loving kindness meditation or your metta mm-hmm. meditation uh, okay. that's a it is a temporary state I mean it is a, a state of you know physiology 
uh, where you know it was it wasn't there five minutes ago, and all of a sudden here it is, like a you know a freight train of of positive you know pro social emotion, where you're you know you just feel you're thinking, you're tending to think about the, your connections to other people and other other beings. I mean, you can feel this way for for a dog or 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 really anything that you can attribute sentience to, and just this. The feel, the experience of being overwhelmed by one's good intentions, right? Like you're right. just, you're just, you know. And, and there, there are different shadings of this. I mean, you can feel compassion in the presence of suffering, right? So if you're, if you're, if you take the state of mind and aim it at at people who are obviously suffering, right? You know, ch- you know, children who don't have enough to eat, or mm. kids with you know pediatric cancer, right? You mm. you, you you watch a video from you know St. Jude's. Children's Hospital, and you see these six-year-olds who are going through chemo, right? And your heart breaks, and you're you feel overwhelmed by by just how much you wish they could be free of suffering, right? If you if you mm-hmm. if you don't, mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's obviously there's a way to feel bad when you look at videos of kids with cancer, right? You can just feel sad or 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 in, in some way diminished you can you can feel like your well-being is diminished by that i mean that's natural but the the real opportunity there is to feel the well-being of of truly wishing these kids happiness and and freedom mm-hmm. from suffering and and that mm-hmm. that's what that's sort of that's the compassion channel that you can you can actually you know consciously train in meditation uh, but then when you when you're Move your attention away from suffering to to somebody to just somebody who's in a kind of a neutral state. Well, then that compassion is is has more the character of of loving kindness, right? You're still mm. wishing them well, but but their their suffering is not the the object of of focus. And then when you imagine somebody who's quite happy, right? Or you see some you know friend who's just had something great happen for them, and and they're you know they're overjoyed with their lives. Well, then you you feel what's called sympathetic joy, which is which is different. I mean, now you're it's the opposite of compassion, really, because this person is getting everything they want in that moment, and you're just happy for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so that's I mean these are different shadings of the same state of mind. Uh, but again, it, the it's not the only state of mind which you're right. which you're which you're ever going to be in again. And so it, it is. It is transitory, and the and the more fundamental thing is to recognize that consciousness isn't encumbered by this separate self in the first place. And so that that's the and that is also this is also a place where I feel like the project of meditation and the utility of psychedelics uh, diverge. I mean, it's not that psychedelics aren't useful, and, and I, I, mean, I do think that again they they I think they're useful even. Even beyond just advertising changes in in consciousness of a sort that get you to to practice meditation, I, I think that you know, like this last mushroom trip I did, seemed very useful to me. I mean, just just kind of blew out the pipes right. in a way that that uh, you know I, I felt I, it, it reset me in a mm-hmm. way that was that was wholly good. But again, it's not a surrogate for this recognition about the nature of the self or the the, the illusoriness of the self. Uh, because the, the the selflessness that's really important to recognize, by definition, has to be available here in an ordinary moment of waking consciousness. It can't right. require the, the you know the psychedelic light show, right? Uh, and so there's something misleading about the experiences that people tend to have with psychedelics that seem to suggest that your freedom. And your your real self transcendence is predicated on, you know, the four hundred megawatt experience as opposed no. to the, the, the your ordinary twenty watt brain, uh, just paying attention to email or whatever it is you is capturing your attention in the present. I've had those moments of meditation where you lose that sense of a physical self. They're so fleeting because the minute it happens, that other thing comes and mm. and is aware of it. But I always, they're always followed. A lot of people experience bliss, and I experience terror in those moments. Mm, that's interesting. Because the, 
it's just a feeling of um, like how much of a lie it all is that uh, the illu- the illusion of time and the illusion. I've I always say when I come into the moment of now, I like freak out. And then when you were talking about that idea of self, it's funny and dreaming is trippy because you are you in your dream oftentimes. And then there are other people in your dreams and mm. they're separate, but it's all in your brain. Yeah. So I'm always like, who is the me in my dreams? Even in my dreams, there's this sense of separateness. It, yeah. And that just shows how deeply identified with self I am. Well, dreaming, it's interesting to consider the, the, the ways in which dreaming is similar to waking consciousness because it's similar in, in many ways. Well, one, it's, it's similar to the degree to which your experience oh, while awake uh, of, quote, the real world is, is entirely a, a visionary experience. I mean, every bit as much as a dream is. I mean, you are in a simulation. I mean, you're, mm-hmm. it, it, neurologically speaking, I mean, you are a mm-hmm. brain in a vat already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, because everything that's getting piped in to your brain from the the quote real world has to be you know, transduced into n- neurological signals in order to get experienced in any way at all. So you're not you I mean you're you're experiencing a vision even with your open eyes you know while you're crossing the street uh, navigating the the real world. Uh, it is a this is it's all being run on your hard drive, right? And it's, right. It's not uh, a direct encounter with something outside yourself, and and again, that that's just as true as it is in dreams. It's just that presumably in in waking life, your visionary experience is is much more constrained by sensory input. I mean, you're getting this this signal that you know you're you're bumping up against hard objects right. out in the world. In a way that you're not in dreams, or, or at least the mm-hmm. the objects in dreams are are more made up. I mean, they're mm-hmm. they're more idiosyncratic to you. And but but there are many other things about dreams that are weird that are somewhat conserved in normal waking life. So, for, I mean, the weirdest thing about dreams, I think, is that we almost never notice that they're dreams, right? Apart from lucid dreaming, right. which is a, a fairly rare phenomenon for most people, which is a, a, a lucid dream is a, is a dream where you know you're asleep and dreaming and, and yet the right. dream, dream persists. Um, and there's, you know, people train can train that as well. And that's actually, you know, traditional meditative practice mm-hmm. in, in Tibetan Buddhism as well. It's called dream yoga. Uh, but for mo- most of us, most of the time, this is a deeply weird phenomenon. We, we go to sleep you know, we we've had this experience of of uh, watching television or or uh, reading a book, and then we 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 turn that off, and we we close our eyes, and we wait for sleep, and then the next thing we experience is some you know crazy situation where we're talking to you know famous people, or we're you know we're on on some beach that we've we've never been to in life and then and you know, mm-hmm. there's a there's a, a a lion there or something 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 that makes no sense in terms of our understanding of the world uh, or even our, you know our, our expectations about the laws of physics and this transition is never remarked on like we this is right. this the, the mind accepts this as just completely fine so we don't even re- <laughs> we don't retain enough memory of our lives to notice that anything is 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 wrong or out of the mm-hmm. ordinary, right? Mm-hmm. And that's just so we have this incredible amnesia, you know, for what should be the you know our expectations for the, the continuity of of our lives. Just you know, just the the our autobiographical self model just gets completely disrupted, you know, because you just think of how how um, surprised you would be if in this current circumstance. You know, a lion showed up at your door, or you started flying, or or you know, a person you knew to be dead uh, called you on the telephone, or like whatever would happen in a dream where you would you would you wouldn't bat an eye. Uh, if you if it happened in, in the waking state, you know, you would have this massive confrontation with with just the the violation of your own expectations for what the future is going to look like. 
So the fact that that doesn't happen in the dream state is weird, but we have this analogous thing that happens in the waking state, which is we we get lost in thought right. moment after moment after moment. And despite our best efforts, I mean, if, if you're, you could be on a meditation retreat where you're, you're, you've decided there's nothing worth thinking about for the next two months, and you're just going to pay attention to the breath or recognize each you know thought as it appears as an object in consciousness. But you know, then you'll find yourself thinking for five minutes about that you know, conversation with with your best friend that didn't go well, and what a fucking asshole he is, and right. and, and, and then you're, you're comp- and for that period, you are psychotic. I mean, you're yeah. you're, you're thinking without knowing that you're thinking. Yep. You are lost on this landscape of mind that has completely subsumed you. Right? You you forgot you were. I mean, you literally had got. You're you're now in a, you're in a meditation center, three thousand miles from where you live. They're, the whole project is for you to be meditating. And you forgot you were even on a meditation retreat because you're busy oh, having yeah. an argument in your in your yeah. imagination. So it it is delusional in the same way that that being asleep and dreaming and not knowing it is delusional, and and it's it's very similar. And, and the moment you become sensitive to that, y- you see how non optimal the default state of consciousness is. I mean, the the idea that it's normal to be having a con- this incessant conversation with yourself and not noticing it and re- be replaying conversations with other people you know in your head and not know, like and and barely being aware of you know that you're driving a car or you know right. uh, at dinner with with your your wife or i mean it's just you're it's we are so close to being psychotic so much of the time <laughs> It's uh, true. It's so uh, there's there's a lot of progress to make uh, from that default state. You made me think of so many things. One, road trips really illustrate this when you're driving long distances and then you realize you forgot you were driving for right. 2 hours. You're right. like, "Where the fuck did I go? Was yeah. I even driving?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that and then I had this experience. It's very common when you get sober to have what are called using dreams. Hmm. And It's a weird, like you were saying, it's, they're very, if a lion showed up in real life, that is kind of something that happens to people who get sober in their dreams when that signals, oh, I'm dreaming, I or I hope I'm dreaming, because suddenly I'll be smoking a joint or drinking, mm. and I've been sober for seven years. And so it signals to me that something is, you know, my my brain or whatever is going on in my dream is like something isn't right. And um, that's a weird phenomenon to, to experience. And even still to this day, I have it where... And the other strange thing is that I'll... I'll start lying about it in my dream. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll hide it. I'm like, even my subconscious is uh, a liar about this stuff. That's hilarious. It's it, weird. Do you, do you have using dreams where you actually experience the state, uh, the, the high of that particular oh, drug? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I've had fully drunken using dreams five years into sobriety. Yeah, that's interesting. Or where I, get, where I get high. And I mean, I spent 20 years of my life drinking and smoking weed. And so it's pretty, I mean, it's probably still in my brain down there um yeah. but it's definitely a strange you know you wake up and you're like oh thank god i wasn't it was all a dream or even in your dream i have had those moments where i've uh that lucid feeling of of oh i'm dreaming because i'm sober mm-hmm. i feel like that happens more now the longer i'm sober the other way that i kind of realized i was like psych- this the psychosis of the mind i i experienced really debilitating hypochondria for about there was a pretty five to five to seven year period where it was crippling Hmm. and it was not i've been through i've experienced depression and anxiety but nothing made me feel more insane than that hypochondria because i was aware that it was not rational that Well, well a pandemic has to be great for you Oh, I'm fine. I I really did, was determined to get on top of it, and mm. I somehow I mean it was a it was a combination of looking at with a psychologist at the underpinnings of it. So for me, I, it would come up when I either was going to feel joy, which I felt like I didn't deserve, or shame. But also just rewiring my brain. I literally put a 
um, rubber band on my wrist. And every time I would have that repetitive thought, I would just stop it Mm -hmm. and shift it and tell myself that I was healthy and that everything was okay. And I had to just be diligent about it. But, oh, my, it took me years. It took me probably two years to really um but it was i there were days where i couldn't get out of bed because my br- i was like my brain is trying to kill me mm. i mm. want to write a book killing your hypochondria before it kills you nice <laughs> i'm sure there's there's going to be more and more need for that <laughs> so i have just a couple of if you had to guess what consciousness is what would your guess be i know that's a loaded question yeah it's it's i don't really have a good answer for that. I mean, I do view consciousness as being conceptually irreducible, which is to say right. that there's no account of of unconscious complexity. I mean, e- even if it is in fact true, and it, it may certainly be true, that consciousness is just an emergent property of a certain kind of information processing, right? So you, right. you, so you have a world where there's... Um, there are physical events that are not at all associated with consciousness. You know, the, the lights are not on, even if there's some complexity there. But then you get a certain kind of complexity uh, and likely a, a, a kind of processing uh, that that we you know readily describe as as you know in, in from conveying information mm-hmm. uh, and some version of that allows the lights to just come on, you know, as if by a miracle. That that may in fact be the world we're in, but I can't uh, that does that does absolutely nothing by way of explanation for me right. about what consciousness is. It's just that will always seem like a miracle from my point of view. I mean, it might be a miracle we just accept, but it's um th- that's not a a version of understanding the emergence of consciousness, from my point of view, and and right. I, I guess I, what I would just point out here is that you know most other scientific explanations, really any other true scientific explanation, functions differently than that. I mean, when you when we understand, when we really understand, you know, DNA, you know, as a as a you know a physical uh, structure and the way in which it conserves the basis for heredity, right? So the way in which, you know, biological systems uh, propagate themselves Mm -hmm. uh, based on the information in their cells. Well, when you, when you follow, you know, it's very complicated, but when you follow the chain of those events, nothing is left out. You're not left thinking, well, but then what is, what is birth and what is procreation and what is inheritance and, and, and what is life? Like even mm-hmm. even the difference between a living system and a dead one is no longer mysterious once you leave us leave out the, the the mystery of consciousness, right? If you right. Just, if you just told me, well, that a living system is is you know consciousness aside, the difference is you know metabolism and growth and wound repair and you know all of these other functions that you can define in terms of you know what cells are doing and and how they process energy. Well then, again, there's there's no there's no black box there that is in principle <laughs> mysterious, but, uh-huh. but with consciousness th- there is, and I, I don't I, I honestly don't see how we get past that. And so and for me the, the the crucial thing is to recognize that it's irreducibly a first person phenomenon. It's, it's something mm-hmm. that that can only be experienced in and as consciousness. Right? It's like there's no evidence for consciousness in this universe apart from consciousness itself. There's no evidence. Right. Like looking at the behavior of living systems does not indicate that consciousness is a thing or that it, that it exists. Right? It's like the, the the whole world could be filled with with robots made of meat that are not conscious, and that's that's completely compatible with the laws of physics, or, or at least it would seem mm-hmm. to be. And and you know, the, there's no, there's no telling. There'd be no indication that we're not in that world, apart from the fact that we know that, <laughs> that there's something that is like to be us, and that likeness, that something that is likeness, is consciousness. Uh, it's it's just so unsettling for some reason. Mm. <laughs> it, it's just 
So do, you don't really buy into the idea of a universal consciousness? Well, it's, it, it's interesting to consider what would make it universal. I mean, the, the, on one level, I buy into it in that consciousness without the sense of self, uh, in my case, is, I mean, the, the, the centerlessness of knowing is is pretty is entirely generic i mean it's not like if you're going to talk about me what's unique to me you know how i know i'm me and not you you're talking about the contents of consciousness you're talking about the memories i have or can have mm -hmm. you're talking mm -hmm. about you know what i'm looking at now as, as as opposed to what you're looking at um but if you're just going to talk about the fact that the lights are on the fact that it's mm -hmm. like something to be me that that strikes me as as the same, and I don't I don't see how you could differentiate that in my case from anyone else's case. So on that level, it strikes me as universal, right? I think right. You, I think we we are recognizing the same thing, but the contents uh, are different. I mean, you you know your your Bridget contents are over there, and and mine my Sam contents are over here, and. In in that sense, it's it's a little bit analogous to space, you know, or at least our, our naive conception of space, where, you know, the the space, the space is universal, but you know, the space in your room is in your room, the space in my room is in my room, right? And it's not a question of 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 mer. I mean, the sp on the on the level of s the space is already merged, right? There really is no frontier between spaces. There's just you when you're talking about the frontiers, you're talking about just the objects that happen to be in space and those those objects mm -hmm. get get they're only where they are they, 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 they're an, they're an expression of space only as and where they appear right so the, right. the the space in your room is only the space in your room uh in your room and yet it's continuous with the nature of space elsewhere right and right again i don't want to put That's too much uh on that as a matter of metaphysics because I don't, I don't really think of the insights one has in meditation as giving one insight into the the structure of the cosmos uh, and right. so, so, you know, <laughs> th th this is where i get off you know th th get off the tram and and uh and deepak chopra stays on for a few more stops <laughs> uh, this is what always trips me up is where does my consciousness end and yours begin it's just a question that I always I, I keep coming back to. Well, you you could almost ask the same thing of your you know past and future states of yourself. Right. right? It's like like uh, in what sense are you the the same person who went to sleep in your bed last night? Right. You woke up this morning. You on some level, I mean, there there is there's psychological continuity in the sense that you have access to some of the same contents of consciousness, but what do we make of those cases where you don't have access, right? Like where you don't remember something uh, now that you did remember yesterday, you know, in, in what sense is that, does that make you a different person, right? I mean, it's, it's possible, and, and you could remember something now that you that you hadn't remembered for years and, and couldn't have remembered, let's say for years, Right, uh, and and so you on some level you have more continuity now with who you were when you were twenty, say, the last time you thought about this thing, uh, than you had with yourself of yesterday. Right. Uh, so it's fascinating. It, yeah. Um, what's the most unexplainable phenomenon you've experienced? Oh, you mean just in terms of kind of spooky? Uh, yeah, otherworldly stuff? I get. Yeah, you're or like the most pseudo scientific thing you enjoy or like to. Uh, I asked Shermer what what conspiracy theory does he kind of enjoy the most or or maybe believe could be true. And I think for you, mine is what what's the most woo thing that you've experienced that you can't you don't have an explanation for. Well, to the great consternation of my fellow atheists and, and skeptics, I've always said that I'm open to evidence for for what's called psi phenomenon, you know, psychic phenomenon, like telepathy and clairvoyance, and and also for for evidence of of uh, rebirth and other spooky things. And 
it's not to say that I believe in those things, but like many people, I've had experiences that seem statistically quite unlikely. Uh, but again, that's we we know the the reasoning errors that that are there to be seen in terms of just how often you 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 know how how often does someone call you and you don't know who's calling you're not keeping score of all the times you you pick up the phone and you just right. you had no idea who's calling you you're just noticing the times you knew who was calling or felt you knew who was calling but i've had you know quote psychic experiences that seem you know just very you know pr- probabilistically speaking they're just they're they just seem very unlikely and right. the you know i'm not proposing that that they're proof of anything but when you have that experience it's very natural to say wow that is that is really weird <laughs> you know i mean mm-hmm. that, it's just that mm-hmm. that was just you know uh, it feels like um yeah i mean the, the the issue the issue around psychic phenomenon is that the the people who've studied it and there's been, there's been a fair amount of of, of study of, of it over the years you know stigmatized though it is serious people have studied it and they they they're quite adamant that they have data that suggests that it, these are actual capacities of the human mind that the people diverge from from randomness over the course of thousands of trials uh, to a degree that it's just just experimentally uh, quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I'm not really in a pos- position to vet all their data or decide whether <laughs> these people are frauds. But I mean, some of the you know, to hear these people speak and to see their their you know academic affiliations, one feels like one is not in the presence of frauds or or madmen. Mm-hmm. But the crucial thing is that what what all of this study is suggesting, you know, if valid, is that th- these are incredibly weak effects, right? I mean, these people are not finding psychics who can walk into the lab and and tell you everything about your past or future or read your mind, you know, the way a, a, a mentalist magician seems to be demonstrating in a performance. These are the very, very weak effects where like you're guessing whether a coin's going to come up head or tails, you know, 50, right. 54% of the time right. rather than just 50% of the time over the course of thousands of trials. Now, if you can do that, that is a a very interesting result because you shouldn't be able to do it over the course of thousands of trials. And you can do the math and say, well, this is a, a departure from randomness that's like you know one in a billion due to right. due to chance, right? So so from an experimental point of view, it seems very interesting, but this doesn't link up at all with the you know, the the spiritual hopes of the average person or the claims of the average guru who claims to have you know magic powers right i mean this is just mm-hmm. not it's such a weak effect so mm-hmm. uh, on some level the you know my my openness to the the scientific study here never really connected with a a traditional view of well maybe maybe we have psychic powers that we can all develop right i mean it's just it's right I mean, and the and the truth is if anyone had significant psychic powers, this would be the easiest thing in the world to demonstrate in a lab. <laughs> I mean, you just right. walk into the lab and I mean, to, to do it convincingly, you'd have to get some trained magician in there, like someone like Darren Brown in there to to ride shotgun with the experimenters just to make mm-hmm. just to make sure that people weren't being fooled in obvious ways. But it's just if anyone has these powers to a significant degree, it, it, these are this is the easiest thing in the world to demonstrate, and so the the fact that it, it hasn't been demonstrated, you know, should suggest that it's um, it's not there. But again, you know, I've had I've had weird experiences, and each time you have one, it there's something something uh, pretty thrilling about it. Yeah. So <laughs> I I ask you one more question, and then my like final two short questions about mm-hmm. yourself. Um, I know you have to go get going. Do you think because the idea of a higher power is an abstraction that it's one institution that won't erode in the pandemic? You know, media and family and governments and businesses are kind of all being put through the ringer, but because God is uh, ineffable, he's quite dependable. Well, I think God is, generally speaking, 
losing his subscribers. There, there is there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of churn in that subscription service. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and 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 it's, I mean, it's just natural because the more we understand what's happening in the world, the more we understand real risk and and how to respond to it. The more we have bad things happen to us and then develop remedies, we see that all of this this help is coming from our own ingenuity and in the absence of ingenuity we're screwed right like right. god god is not going to help at all if you just wait around and pray right so like it's like it's just but it, you know there there are the obviously there are the dead enders who are just will not draw any lessons from from anything including the deaths of their own children right i mean there are people who who are so far gone and so taken in by the the sunk cost fallacy that you know that they'll uh, they're they're willing to to sacrifice their own children in order to not have been wrong about their right. their religion. But most uh, most people, and I think this is just this is only going to become more and more true as we. I mean, well, well, the history of religion now more and more is the history of specific questions and specific problems being answered and solved by something other than religion, right? And there's this a kind of one-way forfeiture of authority that goes from religion to science and never goes back the other way, right? So mm-hmm. there's, there's never, there, there, there are many, many questions upon which religion used to be the trusted authority and now it no longer is because now we have you know meteorologists and neurologists and and food right. scientists and you know it's like why did the crops fail? Well, you're not going to ask your priest. You're going to ask right. the the you know somebody from Monsanto say, um, <laughs> and so that's but that's only going in one direction. There's never there's no story. There's not there's not even a single example. I would I would right. say of something for which science was once the the best authority. But now that authority has gone over to your priest or rabbi, right? It's just it's right. just not happening, and it it, right. it it won't happen, and 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 it especially won't happen because the real baby in the bathwater of religion, the thing we want to save and not throw out, the thing that that actually does justify this you know multi millennium fascination with the the thoughts and and behaviors of you know people like Jesus or Buddha or any of these other you know founders of religions is the th- kind of things we were talking about you know for the first right. part of this conversation i mean the the, the mm-hmm. fact that self transcendence is possible the fact that unconditional love is a state of mind is just there to be experienced you know there has to be a modern non divisive non bullshit encumbered way of understanding these experiences uh, and there is, and, and we're, you know, however uh, ineptly, we're just in our conversations with, with one another trying to craft that understanding. And more and more, it's it, it can't be a matter of retiring to some inherited, provincial, dogmatic, sectarian version of mm-hmm. of these ancient insights. It just it just can't be the the, the motivation for it. Uh, is is becoming more and more heavy, heavily diluted, but just by the fact that all cultures and all languages and all histories are are more and more in plain view. I mean, no one can really be provincial anymore. You can't. Right. You know, it just it makes no sense to have been born a a Muslim and think that you know, just by de- just by good luck you were born into the right, the one true religion in relationship to the one true God and everyone else was born on, you know, on the wrong side of the mountains. Mm. Um, so the last two questions I ask everyone, what is your biggest uh, defect of character or, or you can kind of interpret that however you want. It could be a, a vice you're working on or however you want to interpret that. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I would say, I mean, per- personally, I would say probably complaining and being getting getting caught in negative 
states of mind that just uh, to no they just have no purpose i mean just uh, these again these are kind of micro moments but just to, to keep catching myself throughout the day seeing the negative side of something you know quite unnecessarily and, and maybe expressing some observation about it to Annika or it just it just I mean, complain. It's like a, you know, a good exercise for me would be to put that rubber band on my wrist and snap it every time I complain about something or, <laughs> or you know, judge something negatively. I guess I, it worked. yeah, I, I, you, you inspired me. I'll do that. But that's that's the movie I, I need to uh, scrub from the, the the DVR. It's really hard to catch yourself in that and you know i find gratitude is such a i have because i'm in recovery one of the things we always are doing is gratitude lists and gratitude really is the antidote to a lot of that for me yeah yeah because i too can easily look around and there's a nihilistic bent that is once that train kind of starts going in my brain it it doesn't usually stop until it's at what's it all for which is Mm. a bad place for me to be yeah. And then what's your biggest asset? Um, well, apart from all the things that I'm grateful for in life that are really not me or a matter of what I'm doing, I mean, obviously my, my, my relationships, my family, I'm mean, I just, I'm in a very, I feel, I feel incredibly lucky for the people I have closest to me at this point. Uh, but I think my biggest asset is, my commitment to honesty, which again I've, I wrote this book, Lion, which you, you may or may not have read, but mm-hmm. uh, but when I was eighteen, I, I took a course at at Stanford taught by this great professor, Ron Howard, and it was it was simply an investigation. It was a, a seminar, just more or less focused on whether lying was ever ethical, and we, we spent most of our time focused on white lies, you know, the lies uh. that are tempting. And you know, I came out of that course r- really having had my 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 brain reformatted with respect mm. to the ethics of honesty. And just I just recognized that virtually everything that is going to go wrong, really wrong in a person's life whether in their relationships or in their their reputation in the world, will be a matter of them lying uh, in more and more consequential ways. And if you clo- right. if you close the door to lying, you have just you have radically simplified your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love it, that. It's not to say that there aren't some awkward moments, but but even then. It, it, ultimately, it's an advantage, you know. I mean, they, you recognize there yeah. are pe- people in your life who just don't want the truth, and then you, you don't have to spend a lot of time with those people. Uh, right. But um, so, yeah, that's the biggest. Just just to know that I am in every situation committed to being honest, and I, so I, I don't have to do the arithmetic anymore on, you know, what did I say to that person, and what did you know? It's like. Somebody who's lying always has to figure out how to balance the equation, and they all, they, right. have to, they have to remember what they said in in a certain circumstance. And and uh, you, you just if you're telling the truth, you don't have to remember anything. You just have to keep pointing back to the world or or to to what you currently experience and right. and honestly representing that. And so, and if you get something wrong, or if you make a mistake, or if you, you misspeak. You ju- the 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 antidote to that, or the the remedy for that, is just to just to s- more carefully state what seems true in the present, right? It's right. Just, it's like any inconsistency is not a matter of you having lied. It's you. It's the, either your mind changed, or you were wrong, or you you um you know you misspoke, or but like the, the, like the door the door to embarrassment that is why it's so wide open for most people. Every moment of their life, if they're if they're right. telling lies, just slams shut for all time. If you if you make this fundamental commitment, uh, it's not to say that other things can't go wrong, but um, yeah, it's just it's an enormous source of ethical w- wealth that yeah. I, I would just you know, and it was you know, I've now uh, 
it's now been a very a very long time. Again, I was 18 when I, I had this insight, you know, very much provoked by this one course. And I, I got a chance to interview the, that professor, Ron Howard, in the in the print for the print edition of Lion. So the back of the book is just an interview with him. Oh um, wow! But uh, yeah, so yeah. I, I would say that's it. I love that. In recovery, they say your secrets keep you sick. Mm. That has definitely been my experience. Although I would say I would I would draw a distinction between lying and keeping secrets because right you, you can it's not it's not to say you have to be radically transparent to the world. I mean, if someone says <laughs> you know how much money do you have in your bank account, the mm-hmm. truth can be I don't want to tell you right right like, right. like, like you there's no reason why you need that information uh, right and and so you you can be honest in in uh, being private with certain information but you you just don't have to lie to to be that way right i think they mean it in the more shady sense of the secrets you keep in in addiction yeah um well that's which is usually lying (laughs) yeah i mean when you think of how what's required to maintain an addiction around other people it's it is at every point something that has to be shored up by lies because like Mm -hmm. if you were on if you if you had to be honest about, you know, why you were so tired or why you had bags under your eyes or what, you know, where you were, you know, at three in the morning, uh, very quickly, the dysfunction of your life would leak out into, you know, into plain view for everyone to, to be responding to. Right. Sam, thank you so much. This was really amazing. And I am so grateful for your time and oh, yeah. enjoyed this conversation greatly. I did not I, I could go like Rogan length conversation with you because I have so many questions. So we'll probably have to do it again sometime. Yeah, yeah well, it's a pleasure uh, and, and uh, best of luck with everything you're doing. You've thank got, you. you. You've got a great voice. I, 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 see, I see you mostly on social media, but I always enjoy it on, on Twitter. Thank you. Yeah. Um, where can we find you and your app and all of the things Sam Harris related? Um, well, the, samharris.org is my website and, and the app is is visible there, but that's that's wakingup.com for the the proper app website. And uh, I'm on Twitter and, and the Twitter's the only place I, I, I have a presence on Facebook and Instagram, but those are really just marketing channels for yeah, the podcast like and, and the and the app uh, the, the, twitter is all me however so for better okay. for better and worse i see you had caitlin on your most recent podcast yeah, yeah. i love her she's fantastic she's yeah. the one who got me my she referred me to an editor and i just had my first piece of the atlantic oh awesome. Very, awesome i know yeah she's so great i love her she's one of my uh heroes in terms of female writers that i look up to she's just so brilliant yeah yeah she's she's great uh well congratulations that's a great place thank to publish you. yeah well i done. know i like them thanks well thank you for your time and uh i'll this will i'll be in touch and let you know when this is up cool it's time for the weekly check-in with bridget and cousin maggie uh this week i'm doing a check-in by myself because i cannot find cousin maggie so hopefully she's still alive <laughs> And if she's not, this podcast will never see the light of day. It's been a big week. I was on Joe Rogan uh, last Friday, and it aired on Saturday. For those of you who haven't seen it or heard about it by now, that was pretty cool. I got one of the infamous Joe Rogan COVID-19 tests, which is, I'm not sure how accurate it is, but We had a lot of fun as usual. And then Joe announced his departure from YouTube to Spotify a couple days later. So that's pretty big news. And I'm excited for him. I think that Joe deserves all of the money and success. He has held the line for the American male. And I don't think that there are many places for just that red blooded American male to go. And increasingly less and less spaces where they feel welcome and accepted and places like Playboy have dropped the ball or been unable to hold the line themselves. And Joe has really stepped up and I think it's part of the reason that he has such a massive audience because he's really the only one who's speaking 
to those men. And I have often said, and I think I said to him the first time I was on his show, I'm just so grateful that men have him because he's a good example of someone who's trying to better themselves and he's curious and he's playful and he's uh, talks about health and science and he can admit when he's wrong and is a good dad and husband and all of these things are good. There are so many people who could have filled that void that would have been uh, really bad for men as a whole. So that was fun. He's just such a uh, such a mensch and a good role model and a support and someone I really look up to. And I think ideologically we're very similar. And it's nice to sit down with somebody and just, as he said, shoot the shit and have fun and kind of process the world around us and admit we really don't know all that much about anything. And so that was fun. And just interviewing Sam was really exciting for me because, I mean, I remember when I read The End of Faith, I think I read it right when it came out, and it was so life-changing for me in so many ways because I was struggling with my own Catholicism or the, my Catholic roots. And I've come, um, I have a lot of different feelings about religion and God and I think I really land now after exploring atheism for a couple of years and going down that rabbit hole for a while. I feel like I land on the side of I don't want to pull the raft out from anybody. So I don't really care what people have to believe in order to get through this thing called life. and. I don't want to stand in the way and tell somebody that their their thing that helps them isn't real or their faith is invalid. And I kind of fall all over the spectrum. I feel like I dated a guy who was very religious at one point, and he used to always talk down to me and tell me that I was one of those people who who takes from the buffet of spirituality and my faith in something bigger it wasn't really true because it was so unfocused like i take a little bit from buddhism and i take some prayers from catholicism and i like some of the things judaism has to offer and ultimately i just don't think that people should be dicks my religion is don't be a dick don't hurt other people do your best to not be an asshole and however you get there is kind of irrelevant I was just with Jacob Bressler, the Holocaust survivor that we interviewed or I interviewed here on the podcast, and he said something that stuck out to me. He was, we were just having a chat about the world and his garden because we have to socially distance, and he, but he still is determined to see people, and he was saying that he believes in humans, but he doesn't trust them which I loved. I'm like, yeah, I think that's kind of where I land on this. I trust very few, but I do believe in humanity as a whole in general. And I'm just always in awe of his ability to even say that, given what he knows about the darkness that lies in the hearts of man and witnessing that firsthand. So I don't really know where I'm going with this. I'm just staring at the trees and the butterflies in my backyard. I feel pretty grateful for everything. Everything's really busy. If you're one of the people who emailed me in my in response to my call for angel investors on Twitter and you're listening to this, I promise I'll get back to you. I appreciate the outpouring of support I did not realize I had. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out... Uh, what is the best way to to kind of proceed forward? There's a part of me that also thinks I just need to keep on grinding it out. Um, oh, Maggie's calling me. Too late, Maggie. I need to go eat some dinner. So what else? Not much. I don't know. Everything is very weird. The world is very weird. And yet the two hummingbirds outside my window play magically as if they don't have a care in the world. And I hope that that hawk that lives around here doesn't see them.
And with that, I'll see you guys next week. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs) 